Okay, we'll get started, I think. So, uh, good afternoon. Oh, my name's Mark Sloan and I'm from Agriculture Victoria. Thanks for joining me for this new four-part webinar series looking at business resilience in the Victorian farming community. This webinar series is brought to you by Agriculture Victoria. In this webinar series, we'll be looking at business resilience and how to make farm businesses more resilient when challenged by unforeseen circumstances. Our two presenters today are Matt McCarthy and Mark McKeown. Matt is a managing consultant with ORM and based in Bendigo. He will lead this first session and explore how people help build business resilience. The second part of this webinar will be presented by Mark McKeown from MMA, and he will spend some time looking at strategies and tips for improving personal resilience. If you're watching this webinar on a PC, you can use the chat pod located down at the bottom right hand side of the panel to ask questions at any time. This presentation will aim to be as interactive as possible and there will be some polls and questions which you can also access down the right hand side. Again, thanks for joining me this afternoon and I hope you find today's webinar informative and are able to take away some concrete ideas and strategies to look at with your farm business. Over to you, Matt. Thanks, Mark, and good afternoon, everyone. I've always enjoyed jogging, uh, not marathon running, I've got to say, but just going for a jog for, for, the, for the sake of exercise and for my physical and, and mental health. As I've got older and my body has become a bit, has some sore points and I've, I've had some injuries over time, I've had to adapt my jogging to allow for that. So the intensity, the pace and the length of my jog has been, I've had to adapt to fit in with those limitations of injuries and sore points. This is a little bit like building farm business resilience. It's understanding our limitations as a business, our vulnerabilities, and, and adapting to those and having contingencies in place so that we can build and grow our business with confidence going forward. So, as in a, this is the first of a series of webinars around how we can look at and build farm business resilience. So Mark, Mark has already mentioned that there's a chat box that you can put questions or comments into. There'll be some live, live polling as we go. There'll be a feedback email provided to you after the event today and the recording will be available. If you would like, Mark has also offered to be available to take a call or an SMS from you to give him some feedback about today or suggestions. Also, his email address is on the screen as well. Mark is going to continue to monitor the chat box and provide some input as our moderator today as well. So today we're going to look at a framework for assessing farm business resilience and how it relates to your farm. We're going to be looking at tools and actions that we can take as uh, in regards to farm business resilience. And also we're going to hear from a current, get some current expert advice on a specific um, issue around resilience and farm business resilience. So some of you may be asking, still asking what is farm business resilience it's effectively the capacity of your business to adapt to and recover from a major disruption and that disruption can come in many um, in many sizes and many um, sources just a word of warning when we're looking at farm business resilience we're really assessing and delving into the vulnerabilities of our businesses we're looking at the weaknesses that we have and then looking for contingencies and being proactive around how we can build plan Bs and contingencies to try and adapt to those weaknesses and vulnerabilities. This is sometimes a hard thing to do because we're always looking for the next opportunity and having a positive outlook with our business to grow it. However, this is around understanding where our weaknesses and vulnerabilities are and putting in place contingencies to cover them. And it's about having confidence and reassurance then to go forward in building and improving our businesses. So let's start with a poll. 
In terms of business disruptions, let's think about what are the disruptions that we have endured as businesses up to this point. This will help us um, start the, the session off understanding what we're talking about when it comes to business disruption. So this poll has um, grouped the uh, different disruptions we can uh, experience in the business into some, into some key groups. And so I'd ask you to have a go at filling these out, filling out this poll and, and ticking the box that relates to you. So if your business has experienced um, one or, or a number of these uh, disruptions, uh, just fill the poll out and give us some feedback on that. And we'll, we'll see what, what disruptions people have endured over time. I'm gonna give you a minute just to fill that out and I'll, I'll uh, give you a warning when we're going to close that poll. So please feel free to, to get involved. Um, tick the box and um, we'll see what results we get there. So we'll close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. So thanks everyone for um, participating there. When we think back on it, there are a number of different um, disruptions that we can experience both internally and external to the business. So let's see what we've got there. We have extreme weather events um, uh, are there. So roughly um, half of our audience have uh, mentioned extreme weather events. Disease, 20%. A major machinery breakdown or shedding or machinery fire or power outage in that, that type of event, 20%. Uh, what have we got there? Contractor unavailable no-show, shortage of farm inputs. That type of um, event has affected 14% of participants. Um, death, illness or injury of a key person in the business or relationship breakdown has affected 30% or a third of the participants. An unexpected major market or price downturn uh, has also affected uh, over a third. So the disruptions that we've experienced in the last few months has in the, in the form of uh, widespread bushfires, uh, drought, um, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the economic fallout from that and a very, a very uh, acute example is the, uh, the barley market um, sanctions that have been placed on by China. These uh, just reiterates how events can happen without warning and can have significant impact on the farm business. And so this demonstrates here, I suppose, the, 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 the range of events that can impact and also the fact that some of them are external and are out, really out of our control. We can only just make contingencies to prepare. The other ones happen internally to the business and um, such as people, relationships and, and illness and injury, which uh, is very much internal to the business but has can still have a significant and major impact. So thank you for that. Um, taking part in that poll. So let's acknowledge that it's clear that farming businesses and farming families are very stoic in the face of downturn and natural disaster. But at ORM, we're particularly and acutely aware of the stress that this takes on family members and on the business and the toll that it can take. So how can, what can we do to actually improve our farm business capacity? And, and build the ability of our business to adapt and recover. What we're going to do today is work through some ways of assessing our current capacity and where the gaps might be. And this is a good start to looking at the next step of putting in place contingencies. So what we're aiming to do is to give you some things to think about and some actions to things that you can actually do uh, in, in preparing your business for the next major disruption. We're really, really preparing for the worst, but hoping for the best in all cases. 
It's also a fact that farmers are exceptionally good at, um, at managing production risk in the paddock. So taking timely intervention and taking action in a timely way to enable crops, pastures, livestock, livestock to have the best chance of getting through what is inevitably challenge that, challenges that will come through the season in the way of pests, diseases and climatic events. What we're wanting to do here is to apply this approach to the whole business as a whole and, and to use that policy of taking timely intervention and putting in place strategies that can help the business as a whole meet the challenges ahead. In, in today's webinar, we're going to talk about and focus on decision making, what the decision making structure is in your business. We are also going to look at a practical approach to um, delving into the roles and responsibilities in your business and clarifying those with your team, being your family, employees, contractors, etc. Identifying your key people, and we're also going to be looking at managing personal stress and decision making. Firstly, before we go any further, I wanted to introduce the concept of the three pillars of your business. The three, the three pillars of, of any farm business are made up of people, which is around management decisions, communication, safety and well-being of your people, the workforce and records and reporting. The second pillar is financial. And we capture these in profit, cash flow, debt management, financial buffers and marketing of product. The third pillar of any farm business is the resources pillar. And this captures everything pretty much to do with the production system the land and water, machinery, technology, infrastructure, and the supply chain to drive that production. So they're the three pillars of any farm business. Today, we're going to focus on the people pillar. And that is important because that's about you, the people in the business. And, and these, this is an important driver of the business, obviously. We are going to focus in, again, further into management and decisions. Of course, management and decision-making is critical in any business. And in the in the a time of a major disruption, it comes into focus even more. Today, we are going to, when we talk about management and decisions, we're going to talk about personal resilience. And later on, Mark McKeon is going to join us to talk about um, some tips around in, in helping you with personal resilience. Now, Mark uh, had uh, 18 years in the AFL as a player and as a high performance coach. And he now works in leadership development, resilience and workplace effectiveness. So we're just going to um, have a quick chat with Mark now uh, as a prelude to our, our catch up later on. Hi, Matt. Good day, Mark. How are you going? Good, thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for dialing in. As um, yeah, Mark, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to uh, ask you to, to divulge which AFL club you did play for, and and uh, in case it prejudiced you, but uh, but if we could just get a couple of points as to what you're going to just talk about a bit later, Mark. Yeah, sure. As you said in your intro, you're going to be talking a lot about farm resilience and the importance of decision making. Well, for you as leaders on the farms, it's really important for you to be in the right mental and physical space to be making sure you're making those right decisions of short and long-term uh, ones. So I've got three really practical tips to assess how you're going and how to build your resilience and control the inevitable stress that we all face. So I'll look forward to chatting to everyone a little bit later in the uh, webinar. Thanks, Matt. That's great. Thanks, Mark. We'll talk to you a bit later on.
So let's um, let's have a little bit more of a look at um, decision making in your business, and I'll ask everyone to th try and think about your own situation, your your own business, uh, and your particular situation, and how it works with you. But um, business decisions is not there's not one way of making them. However, they need to be timely. They need to be informed as much as possible within the time constraints you've got, and they need to be proactive. Sometimes decisions are not made. They're left unmade until they get to a point where there's only one option to take. This is a reactive situation. What we want to try to do is to be in a proactive decision-making uh, mindset. So some, just some things to um, ask yourself about decisions in your business. So is it always clear who's making the final decision and who is carrying out the actions? Is it always clear who is responsible to carry it out and what the action is that that person is, is carrying out? Is it always communicated to the people that need to know the outcome of the decisions? And who gets to have input to the decisions in your business? So we just stop and think about that for a moment in relation to your, your particular situation. Is there clarity or confusion on who's making the final decision? Is it always clear what action is to be taken? Is it always clear who is responsible to carry it out? And is this communicated to others in the business who need to know? And finally, who has the opportunity to have input to the decision making? If we look at some theory now, there's basically three levels to every, decisions fall into three levels of strategic decisions, that's long-term, maybe to a three to five year outlook. Uh, tactical, which is pretty much confined to the season at hand. So um, the 12 month season, uh, decisions that are made in there are called tactical decisions. And then there's the operational decisions, which are the decisions we make on a weekly basis and in terms of um, you know the daily um, work workload, so let's make try and make this uh, a bit more practical and apply it to a farm. In this table, what I've done is break, as you'll see, a strategic, tactical, and operational level of decision making. There's a column there showing some examples, which I'll drop in in a moment. There's uh, a column there that says who. So I'd really like you to think about your situation on your farm and think about who's involved at these different levels. Then I've got a, a column with external, which means there are always people from outside the business which are involved in the decision making, nearly always. And then in the, the final column, I have how that decision is communicated or documented within the farm business. So let's look at an example of a mixed uh, cropping livestock farm as an example. So yes, I've made the point there that we need you, I would like you to think about who on your farm is involved. So the strategic level of decision making, so these are things such as the business ownership structures, the business direction and expansion, uh, succession and estate planning type um, issues. And they are often or can be uh, have input from an external advisor or advisors and then they often can be communicated via a family meeting uh, it might be an advisory board uh, a business planning process partnership or business agreements so question i have is for you to think about how does it work on your in your business um, how does it work? This is an example that I'm working through. How does it work in your business? In the tactical decision level, we have things like, um, and this is in a sort of 12 month cycle, we have things like um, capital expenditure, the enterprise mix that you that you go with for, this, for each season, uh, inputs managing all those decisions around inputs into the farm, whether they be fertilizer, chemical, seed, fodder, whatever it is. 
uh, the marketing of the product, and also things such as tax management, which is, um, comes around every year. We know that. So those external people who will have contributions there are people such as agronomists, bankers, accountants, input providers, etc. And they're captured and communicated in paddock plans and, and often through um, uh, paddock software, but paddock plans, cash flow budgets, tax statements, livestock selling schedules, etc. So who's involved in that business level of uh, decision making in your business? And then the operational. So this is the paddock operations that we're very familiar with, the stock husbandry, machinery maintenance, infrastructure repairs and maintenance. Again, external providers um, will have input at times to these operations as well, or these decisions. And it can also involve contractors and those sorts of um, providers. <clears throat> and they're captured in, and, and the decisions are captured in work plans, job lists, uh, work, weekly work meetings, toolbox meetings, uh, and often these days in um, are communicated via phone apps such as WhatsApp and Wonder, Wonderlist and, and others. So hopefully you've had to think through who in your business is involved and is making decisions uh, in those three levels of strategic, tactical and operational decisions. So it's time, it's time for another poll, everyone. So let's, um, let's get active uh, and get involved. So um, the poll we're going to ask you about here is just having thought through that, those different levels of decisions in your business. Let's just um, think about how you think you're going in your business with those three levels of decisions in terms of you know, how they're made, um, timely, proactive, um, informed and also um, how they're communicated through the business and documented. So um, we've just asked you to rate your business um, uh, with, a, with a bit of a rating as being excellent, good, okay, and needs a lot of work or a lot more work. Um, so they're the, uh, the four categories we have. Um, it's uh, in, in the strategic, decisions that your your business is making in the tactical decisions that your business is making is it is it uh you've got it covered you're kicking goals it's all good excellent um it's good it's it's obviously improvement some room for improvement but we're going good okay which probably means yeah probably 50 50 um and then needs a lot of work uh it sort of speaks for itself and then right down to the operational decision making on your farm. So um, we'll close that in, give you a few more minutes, a few more seconds or a little bit more time to, uh, to uh, fill that out. So we'll close that poll now in five, four, Three, two, one. So thanks for again for um, taking part, everyone. Um, let's see how the group has rated itself um, in terms of how they they see their uh, performance in the decision making stakes. So in the strategic decisions, we see that um, majority of people are in the good to okay. 10% um, are saying we need a lot more work uh, and uh, one or two people, participants, have rated their business as being excellent in the strategic decision stakes. In the tactical decisions, we've got, again, two is excellent. Two have classified themselves as excellent. In the middle, good and okay, we've got sort of 50% in that category. And, a, and again, a small group saying they need a lot more work there. In the operational, slight, slight uh, shift there. There's a few more considering that they're good versus okay. And um, at each end, we have 
uh, a couple saying that they need a lot more work or are excellent. Probably from, from uh, our experience in, in working with farm businesses, the strategic decisions are often the, the ones that um, need the most amount of uh, most amount of input and the most amount of attention in terms of getting them uh, set right. Uh, in this case, um, people are saying they're good to okay in that area, but in our in our experience, that's the area where the businesses are most um, uh, potentially vulnerable uh, in that whole strategic area. Um, tactical and, and operational decisions are often well catered for. But anyway, that's good just to get a, a feel from everyone as to where the audience is uh, sitting on this at the moment. So back to uh, screen share. Yep. So sometimes, oh, sorry, I will stop there um, just to ask if there's any questions. Um, uh, from Mark, Mark Sloan, if there's a, any questions that have come in that we need to um, address at this point, we can. Um, I've got one here from David Jamison, um, just asking, does this poll reflect the ORM database? So I'm not sure if uh, David's, you know, is that David's asking if that poll has been informed by maybe your current client base or the feedback you get from them? Maybe David could clarify his question there, but um, thanks for chipping in with that one, David. Um, yeah, yeah. Does anybody... you know, I did make some comments there in regards to yeah our experience with um, with with clients um, uh, there, but uh, I'm not quite sure if I've need to clarify that more. But we may get some more input from um, clarification on that from David. But I, I will I will push on then, um, Mark. So. Um, so sometimes within the farm business, uh, when it comes down to decision making and, and who's making decisions, uh, it can be quite unclear. And as to who is actually responsible for making decisions, who's responsible for carrying them out. Um, so the, um, the way we can, we can tackle this in a practical way is to develop a roles and responsibilities um, table for, for your business. And uh, up on screen at the moment is an example of a, a worksheet where a business has um, allocated roles and responsibilities out to its, its uh, multiple family members involved in the business and, and employees. And so this business, again, is a mixed livestock property, a livestock cropping property. And um, so they've developed this roles and responsibility sheet. So really, I'm just giving you a snapshot there of what it looks like overall. Um, and we're just going to delve a little bit more into what it means and how it works. The first thing that we need to do is develop a list of the key business activities that take place within the business. So in this case, uh, I've taken um, a, examples, of, of, I've taken a, zoomed in on uh, the business activities in this worksheet. And they include cropping activities from crop planning through to harvest and grain delivery uh, in the sheep area, um, we've got from purchasing and husbandry through to transport. And um, and then the financials, a key area, um, has been listed and broken down into its components. And then also uh, the marketing of, of um, product. So that, that's the, the list of business activities. So I'd encourage you to think about um, your, your business. Uh, what would you consider to be the key uh, business activities? that require decision making and management um, in your business and and uh, just work through with us here. But in this case, this is a, a mixed livestock um, cropping operation. So if I could zoom in a little bit further into this one, um, just to uh, draw it out a bit more. So with the, um, the cropping activities, we've listed the key tasks and areas that need to be managed. Um, and I've taken some subsample of these. 
the people who are responsible. So the responsible person is the, the most logical person to fall into that role. And they're the person with the, the, the skill and the knowledge and also the interest and, and passion for those um, those task areas to, to be the leader in that area and to um, drive the decision making, ensure everything's done. They don't have to do it all themselves. That's often a, um, a common misconception. They don't have to do it all, but they do have to ensure that the jobs are done when they need to be done. And then the next in line. So the next in line is the person who is the most natural replacement or stand in for the person who's responsible in the case that uh, they're not there for whatever reason. Um, and so that person is the next in line and they may be uh, learning some of the issues and some of the um, factors that have to be managed within that um, key activity, but they, they're the next in line. And then we, we put in there the external people that get involved. And uh, in this case, it could be um, agronomists, advisors, um, contractors. I've also listed in there the period of time in which this activity is most intense and requires management. And so this starts to build up a bit of a profile of the business uh, and the key times that um, those, key, those business activities have to be managed. And it also starts to show you who your critical people are. So in this case, I've also drilled into the financials area and, um, and listed those there, as you can see. So just to reiterate, Sarah is responsible for in-crop monitoring. Um, Russell is the next in line. The external input is coming from the agronomist and the period of time that that activity is most um, intense is from June to November. So, um, so the question we have is, I have, sorry, for you is how does your, how does your roles and responsibilities um, line up in your business? And, and you may be at a point where you're saying, well, yes, we've got this all sorted. The next level of detail is to go into some role descriptions within these um, responsibilities and next in line, what's actually, it can be documented what their roles are. But the process of the business, the people in the business going through this and working out who's, who's responsible, who's next in line, uh, who's our key external input, um, going through that process helps clarify the situation as how decisions are going to be made and communicated. But we then have to start looking at vulnerabilities. So where are we vulnerable? Um, in this case, this business, as you'll notice, that Alicia is responsible for pretty much all the um, bookkeeping and HR and compliance matters and tax, et cetera. Um, and so a vulnerability in this business is that there's no one else is interested in, in uh, keeping up with and, and uh, being across those, um, those matters. So this is a gap that th this business um, needs to uh, work on a solution or a contingency. And that, and that may be to find someone in the business who's willing to step up and is interested. They might need, just need some encouragement. Or uh, then you're, you could go to an external source to become your plan B in that area um, and have that as your, your uh, next uh, plan B. So looking at contingencies, once you have this together, helps in terms of looking at the resilience of the business. So and the contingency may be to get encouraging people to take that next in line position and learn uh, that aspect of the business and encourage them to learn as much knowledge from the, the main decision maker as they can. Yeah, so there's, so I'm just going to take a, um, just reading what's coming in here on the chat. So, um, Mark, so I'll just take a quick. So we've got uh, many businesses, there are very few people involved. Yeah, and I acknowledge that for sure. Um, become very top heavy and the workloads can become very top heavy and somewhat left out. 
contractors are then engaged to perform duties. Responsibilities may rely on one or two people. The difficulties begin. Yeah, now this is this is a classic case, and in a lot of cases, um, people may see their name against a lot of these um, right, uh, responsibilities and decision making. So, I think the question then becomes, and it's been pointed out there by David that. What do we do if we have a huge reliance on one or maybe two people what can we do to tackle that um, and that's where you really have to look at your own personal resilience is it are you coping okay um, and are you managing okay and and we'll talk a bit more about that with mark mckeon in a, in a minute but the other side of it is can you delegate is there opportunity to delegate to others in the family or in the business or to an external um, provider, um, that sort of thing. I suppose this is where groups come into their own too. If if you um, only have you know a couple of people in the involved in the business, in being involved in a group can get peer support for decision making um, and that sort of thing. But um, it's uh, it's a good point. But but doing that um, and again, Malcolm's mentioned taking it doing a team swat um, again that's great uh, suggestion to look at your strengths weaknesses in in your team um, what are you good at what aren't you so good at and you know looking at opportunities to improve on that whole matrix of knowledge skills and responsibilities so sometimes actually there's there's siblings involved in um, farming together and it's quite common for one of them, and it might be, you know, brother, sisters, two sisters, two brothers, I don't know, an uncle and, and, and a, a nephew, Rela relations in business together. And then, and one of them will say, I'll be the doer and you can be the manager. And, uh, and that can work really conveniently for a lot of businesses, but it is important for the person who's the doer to, um, to be aware of things, critical things um, that, uh i suppose critical uh functions so and and be aware of things like pin numbers and passwords and those sorts of things where they're kept they need to be kept in a in a central point and they can be accessed in the case where there's a major disruption and and the other the the manager is not there for for whatever reason and um or is out of uh out of action So just uh, one one other point I will make with this is that um, is that uh, it does pro also provide an opportunity for the younger generation uh, to be encouraged to step up and have their name placed in this in this matrix and be encouraged to take on responsibility. And in my experience, that can be quite powerful for the younger generation in the business to be. You know, formally written down into a document such as this as being responsible, and it, or or next in line, and um, it gives them permission to be, you know, have, to, to have a place within the management structure of the business, and it can always and it can always help with the transition process of management over time, by by having these sorts of um, documentations, and again, it's building the underlying resilience of the business by having good communication and, and, and relations within within the business so I'll just I'll just stop here for a moment just to pause and um, and we'll just have a look at how um, how you went so thinking about your own situation here your own farm um, did you have a think about who's responsible in your business who's next in line is is that um, something that's clear within your um, business situation who's your key external um, where does your key external input come from um, where are you reliant heavily reliant on external input uh, is that a vulnerability or a strength um, can be either depending on the, the situation 
who are your critical people? Who are the critical people in the business? And and uh, what are they doing um, in the business? How how are you reliant on on them? Are you overly reliant on them? And do you have a contingency? Where are you vulnerable? And do we have do we have contingency options in place? So um, I think we'll uh, switch to, we'll bring in um, Mark McKeon now. It might be a good time to bring Mark in to the discussion and um, and uh, hear from Mark around some personal resilience um, uh, tips. Okay, no, yeah. so, Hi, Matt. I'm back. Hi, Matt. So, Mark, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, good on right. you. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Thanks, um, thanks for that intro, and I've been listening to that with interest. So uh, I'd just like to say at the outset that I think a lot of farmers are fantastic in regard to resilience, the ability to deal with setbacks and problems, and also understand that everybody's different. But I'd like to, if I can, give you three really practical tips and things to, to do virtually on a daily basis. And the, the foundation of this is resilience. And resilience, sometimes people think, is I've got to be so strong that nothing affects me at all. We can have a weather event or a machinery event uh, or a, a cropping failure and it just doesn't worry me. Well, of course it does. Resilience is not so being impervious to all the pressure and problems. It's more. It's not even so much about bouncing back as we used to think with resilience. There's been a lot of work done about how resilience in the brain works. And basically what resilience is now is keeping the ability to move forward, to, to make that next decision, whether it's an operational one or whether it's a strategic one. And I like to use as my foundation what's called the stress curve, which is just a good old-fashioned bell curve or a hill. And if you think about that stress curve or that, that hill in, in four quarters, the first quarter, the bottom part of the hill, is when you're so laid back, you're probably not that motivated, you're not feeling that energetic, and you're probably a bit bored. And we don't really want to be in that quarter, in that quadrant. The next sort of part of the stress curve, the way that's sort of on the, on the way up the hill, almost to the top of the hill, that's where you want to be. That's when you're energetic, you're focused, you're determined, you listen well, you make good decisions, you're, you're considering all of the options and so on, and you have that drive and that, and that resilience that I know a lot of farmers have. That's where you want to be. That's why I often say don't go over the hill because at the top of the hill and as you start to go to the other side, that's when people become overstressed, overburdened, fatigued, maybe making rash decisions or the wrong decisions or having angry outbursts and so on. Uh, and that's not that's not where you want to be. And, of course, right down the other side of the hill is where people suffer some pretty horrible things with anxiety and depression and burnout and worse. So everybody suffers stress. And being a bit stressed from time to time doesn't – it's not a weakness. It's just reality. But I love to think of myself as being not at the bottom of the hill and so laid back I can't get off the couch – but on the way up that hill, in that productive, that focus, that energetic zone, but I'm always saying to myself, don't go over the hill. Because when I go over the hill, I'm likely to make bad decisions and be fatigued, not have the energy, get angry at people. And if I go too far over the hill, you're opening yourself up to those pretty nasty things. So, Mark, that's um, it's a good point. We don't want to go over the hill. And the tendency is to, when especially in times pressured times is to just push ourselves over there. So how, how can we, um, how do you suggest we keep ourselves in that, on that hill? Sure, sure. Well, look, I think there's three practical things. As leaders and sometimes being potentially a bit isolated from larger groups of people, it's really important to have a couple of practical things. And the first one is simply holding your breath. And what I mean by that is, We've all got like a, a residual amount of time we can hold our breath for when circumstances are neutral. It might be 30 seconds, it might be a minute, it could be longer for some of you. But the more stressed you are, the less period of time you're going to be able to hold your breath. So the first thing, it's a great indicator of where you are on, on that hill. 
And in order to sort of get a guide of what you're like in that area, all you need to do is sit down first because you don't want to hold your breath so long that you pass out. It's obviously potentially dangerous. So you sit down and you take a few deep breaths just like this. Just don't hold it in between. You just inhale, push it out, push it out, inhale, push it out. Do that 10, maybe 15 times, then take a deep breath in Use your, your watch or your phone or, what, or whatever you've got handy and just time how long it takes you to hold, how long you can hold your breath for. And it's not a competition about how long you go, but it just creates a benchmark. Then in normal circumstances, after you've done that first one, if you repeat the process another two or three times, so again, in and out about 15 times, deep breath in, stop, hold it, and just sort of record where you're going. And in my case, when I do it three or four times, I double the amount of time that I can hold my breath compared to the first time. Your lung capacity doesn't change, but it's just because you get into a more relaxed, mindful, in-tune type state. So I use it sort of roughly as a daily thing, as almost like a mindfulness or sort of semi-meditation thing. But I also use it if I've got a decision to make or if I'm feeling a bit anxious about something, then I will do the breathing, hold my breath, and it tells me straight away whether I'm in the right frame of mind to make this decision. So in a farm situation, if you're going to make a machinery decision or a cropping decision or a contractor decision, you don't want to be making that decision if you're sort of close to the top of the hill. And by simply taking, literally takes three or four minutes at the most to just see where you're at with your breathing, it's a great way of identifying where you are, but also if you need to sort of come back down the hill a bit. Yeah, right. That's a great little rule of thumb uh, to use that as a, as a measure as in holding your breath as to how you know, how potentially stressed you are and what mindset you might be in. So, yeah, that's that's a good one, Mark. Yeah. Um, the second one is simply a, a thought process uh, and it's called see it, feel it, release it. And what that is is sometimes we get so engrossed in our thoughts, it's never going to rain or how am I ever going to fit, you know, uh, uh, fix this harvester or my what am I going to do with, me, you know, my, my crop selection? Am I going to take the agronomist advice? Am I going to take my financial advisors? And we just, we just get so wrapped up in it that it's almost like we become the thought and the thought gets so far in front of us, you can't see around it and you don't have your normal perspective. So see it, feel it, release it is almost like you're coaching yourself or you're looking in on yourself and, and you are become aware of the thought. And the thought, let's say, to do with the weather, obviously we can't control the weather, but simply by being aware of the weather, we no longer are the thought, we see the thought. Sometimes people say, see the thought, don't be the thought. So now I suddenly think, okay, I'm, I'm stressing about the weather, I'm stressing about a staff member or a family member, I'm stressing about one of my kids, whatever. And seeing it makes you aware of that. The second part is feel it. And feel it is really where you say, okay, well, it's it's legitimate. I'm human. We worry about things. We sometimes have negative thoughts. I'm not a bad person by having this thought. But now I'm just, I'm sort of like processing the thought. I'm not trying to be hard on myself. I'm not trying to even necessarily solve it. I'm just being aware and understanding that's there. So, so I've felt it. And the third part and the most important part is called release it. And that means let the thought go. So instead of being wrapped up in this thought or the thought sort of surrounding me so I can't see my way past it, I've seen it, which is I'm aware of it. Then I feel it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not trying to solve things. I'm not trying to justify. I'm not trying to blame. I'm just saying it's, it's natural. I'm a farmer. I'm concerned about the weather or I'm concerned about machinery. That's a natural thing. But then most importantly, I'm going to release that thought. That's taken me a couple of minutes to explain. That whole process takes about 10 seconds. Oh, I'm aware of this. I'm thinking about that again. Uh, and then, uh, okay, it's legitimate. And now I've just got to, I've got to release it. And you can use that in all aspects of your life. I use it when I play golf. Kelly Slater, the surfer, uses it all the time. See it, feel it, but then most importantly, release it. Thanks, thanks, Mark. So, how do you? Um, is there any way of uh, tips on how you do that? Not the release. How do you sort of mentally do that? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I think some sort of image is is a good thing there. So the obvious one is like it's a, a problem is almost like a bird and you, you're holding the bird and you, you, you're feeling the bird and then you release it and it flies away and the negative thought or the, the what thing that's sort of stressing you out flies away a little bit. Some sports people use the idea if they have a negative thought about a shot or a score or a game that they imagine – um, and an imaginary um, hole in the ground opening up and they dump that thought into the hole in the ground and as they keep walking in their mind, a link comes back and it's, and it's now gone. Some people like to think of the problem being like a ball and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller till it becomes just a pinpoint and then it disappears. Or you might want something a bit more extreme and you see a thought exploding in through you in a million bits and it goes away but it's just some image that completes that process i'm no longer wrapped up in the thought of acknowledge the thought which is uh, feel it and then release it whether you want to do that gently like a dove flying away or you want to blow it into a million bits whatever works for you is fine um so see it feel it release it yeah that's yeah. um good one. We can remember that pretty easily. Yeah. So what's your third tip? And one more. So, so so far we've got the breathing one, which is a physical thing. Then we've got see it, feel it, release it, which is more of a, a mental thing. And the third one is a, a thing I just call it sit and listen. And I think this might be something that a lot of uh, a lot of the farmers who uh, who have dialed in might already do because you live in such fantastic environments. But as a way of just coming down that hill a little bit. I just sit on a, on a back deck and I just listen for sounds. And what I find is the first sort of 60 seconds to two minutes, it's just the obvious sounds that you can hear. So it might, for me, it might be a bit of road noise. It, you could be hearing some air conditioning, the sound of your own breathing, uh, your house uh, sort of contracting <laughs> depending on the temperature, what, whatever's happening around. But then if you just sit and then just focus on one thought for a couple of breaths, the traffic. Then you focus on another thought. It could be you might be able to just pick up the noise of a refrigerator or, or, or something humming inside. But then as you start to do that, within two or three minutes, you will start to identify thought, uh, uh, excuse me, sounds that you weren't even aware of a couple of minutes ago. I find it's fantastic with, with bird life and natural life and distant sounds. And uh, I can even, when I really sort of tune in after a couple of moments, I can hear trains right in the distance that I wouldn't normally hear. And all you're doing with that is using one of your senses, your auditory sense, to actually calm your whole body. And while you're not really trying to reduce your heart rate and your blood pressure physically, that's exactly what happens. And it just tunes you in because using your senses is a great thing. Uh, and for, you know, farmers live in such a great environment. There's such magnificent sounds, especially at night. Uh, and to actually sit, relax, not trying to do anything too funky. You're just trying to just take one sound at a time. And I find sometimes I get 10, 12, sometimes even more sounds that I identify different bird sounds and different natural sounds. sounds. And when I do that for five or 10 minutes, I just feel like um, just makes me feel really centred and productive. And again, I think it's a great thing to do when you're trying to weigh up a decision. You might be mulling over some paperwork, taking a few minutes to sit and listen, you'll often find that the right decision just pops into your head. And in terms of business resilience and, of course, the role of personal resilience in making those right decisions and, and having those great relationships as a leader, I think doing hopefully one of these things every day and more if you can is a great way of building and protecting your personal but also your farm resilience. Yeah, that's um, th that's great. Thanks, Mark. I mean, those those tips you've given us, we don't need to have any equipment or any sort of special, um, you know, arrangement or setup. We can just do them at any time, really. And so um, I think that's really, really practical advice you've given us there. So thanks very much for joining us today. Um, I think um, we're we're time's running down. Is it? Yeah. So, Time's running down, so we, we probably haven't got any specific questions by the look of it for you. Yeah, I haven't um, seen Matt. anything come through, Matt. So Yeah, okay. Uh, so so that's been good. Thanks, Mark. That's been um that's been great. So just uh, hang on there. Don't don't go away on us. Uh, we'll we'll just finish up 
uh, now, I think. So, um, so Mark's given us um, those tips, uh, breathing and holding our breath, see it, feel it, release it, sit and listen for five minutes or so. And um, as I said, pretty practical advice that anyone can, can take up. So our, uh, just winding up today, just, uh, just a bit of a call to action to remind us, um, you know, people are one of the key pillars of our business, um, how resilient we are in the business around people. We've focused in today on management and decision making. But um, again, we looked at strategical, tactical and operational decisions. Uh, roles and responsibilities, are they clear? Uh, the communication but within that structure clear as well? Um, identify your critical people and your dependencies. Uh, where are you most vulnerable? Need to, we need to look at where our vulnerabilities are in regards to decision making and, and key people. And then what are the contingency options we have that we can we can take uh, when, once we've identified where we may have some weaknesses um, showing. Um, if you have, uh, if you'd like um, to more information on our support programs through Agriculture Victoria, um, there's a link you can uh, go to agriculture.vic.gov.au slash dry seasons. Our next webinar, which is webinar, the second webinar in this series, will be held on June the 18th at 1.30, and that will be around financial resilience. How do we assess what can we do around um, financial resilience in our farm business? So we will have a guest speaker who will be also on that webinar, um, Jane Foster, who is an agribusiness consultant um, with um, a long background in um, banking and also farm consulting. If, uh, if you or anyone you know is having difficulty coping, uh, please take note of the Lifeline number 13 11 14. And also there is a, uh, or Google Beyond Blue uh, website does have um, uh, information and links, important links there as well. I'd like to acknowledge Mark Sloan and Mark Gould and Z Flett from Agriculture Victoria in preparing um, this webinar and also Nathan Pollock and Belinda Cowburn from ORM. That's all we have time for today. I really um, hope that you've enjoyed the um, webinar today and the activities and interaction. Um, we look forward to seeing you on the next webinar on June the 18th. And uh, in the meantime, I uh, wish you a, a, a good afternoon. If it's okay, Matt, I might just jump in and just say a few more words. Is that fine with you? Sure, Mark. Yes. Yeah, so thanks very much, uh, Matt and Mark. Um, just before you go, Mark, there was one question, or uh, well, one statement more. Is that fine for you to answer, Mark? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Please. So Lisa uh, made the comment that some good thoughts from Mark, so yeah, well done. However, farming often throws at you problems you cannot directly, directly influence, such as price, weather, global markets making resilience challenging. Have you got any anything for Lisa to go away and work with? Yeah, look, definitely acknowledge that, that there's a lot of things that um, uh, are outside your control. So I absolutely understand that and actually have a uh, relative who's, who's actually personally in that situation. So I definitely acknowledge that. But I think that, that, that second one, that see it, feel it, release it, is sometimes we can almost stew in our own juices. We become so worried about something that we that we can't control that it affects everything else we're doing. So for example, you might be able to influence those particular things, but there's lots of other things you can influence. But if you get so wrapped up in that thought or that worry and that anxiety, and it sort of sends you up towards the top or all over that hill, you are then neglecting the things that you, you may be able to control. So that's the see it, feel it, understand that, and by releasing it, it's going to free you up to um, potentially concentrate on the things that, that you can control. So I definitely understand the, um, what you're saying there, uh, but it's almost all the more reason to influence the things you can influence to the best of your ability. Thanks for the comment. All right, cheers. Thanks very much, Mark.
Um, we've still got a few people online, so I'll just take this opportunity to thank everybody for taking the time to participate in today's discussion. Uh, in particular, those of you who made suggestions in the chat pod, that was much appreciated. Um, I also hope you found a couple of strategies from Matt and Mark to take away and apply personally or to your business. Uh, please check the follow-up email you received later today. I believe Matt has attached that roles and responsibilities template to the email, Matt, is that right? Just not hearing you, mate. Yeah, we weren't able to do that technically. Uh, so um, yeah, we, we'll, we'll make it available. We can make it available if people would like it. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah, I'll touch on that in a second then. So yeah, if you've got any follow-up questions or anything you think about in the next fortnight between webinar two, feel free to reply to that email that ORM will send out or you can give me a call on 0436 833 668. It's 0436 833 668. Leave a voice mail, uh, voice mail message SMS or have a quick chat and then I can document that feedback and questions and share it with Matt before webinar too. Um, yeah, I think that's all. So thanks again and I hope you're all back in a couple of weeks. Cheers. Thanks Matt and Mark.